got a chance to change one thing in Africa, what will it be? Wow. <laughs> How would change the mindset of women especially? Wow. Preach. The mindset of women wanting everything to be brought to them easily. We have the potential, we have the creative minds to do work for ourselves. So if I was to change anything, I would really make sure women really put their minds to work, focus on making a change in our society, not only to wait for people to bring them already made stuff. My name is Christine. I am born and raised in Uganda. I have a bachelor's degree in information technology and I'm a happily farmer and we have a mixed farm here, it's called Value Farm. Of course I operate it with my co-director or my business partner. When you wanted to partner with him to go into farming, mm. what were your parents saying or even your friends around you? Oh my God, in fact they were shocked. My dad of course, didn't know about it, not until he started seeing the videos coming out. I didn't tell him because I, I feared at first, I was like, how are they going to, they wasted their money to take me to university. <laughs> then <I'm, laughs> they're going to see me farming. But actually, he called me one time. He told me, I watched one of your videos. I'm so proud of you. Aww. He was so proud. I was Aww. like, I was in shock because I'd really been scared to even tell him that I'm doing farming. It's been definitely um, challenging, rewarding, like anything in life that you, that's worth having, you have to work for it. And um, so far, so good. I don't think I would do anything differently if I had to do it all over again. I, the only thing I probably would do differently was get to UG maybe 10 years sooner. We actually started a mixed farm because it is really a necessity. Most people really want to do crop farming, but livestock is also inevitable. We started with three goats. Three goats. <laughs> You'll see the numbers coming. We started with three goats. Everybody thought we were crazy. We had all this land and all the workers that was working for us at the time building the fence, they're like, look at we're the stupid American. At they have all this place with just three goats. <laughs> So the hardest moments are the, are the days when maybe we are taking them to the, to the market, to the butcher, or maybe other people are taking them to other farms. Of course, that attachment still hurts. So most times we do the selection and we, I go somewhere else so that I don't see, I don't experience them leaving the farm. Farming to me means, you know, an opportunity to actually have a chance of creating something, right? Apart from, you know, going to work, getting a steady paycheck, that's somebody giving you something. With farming, you actually have the opportunity to actually put something in the ground with your own bare hands and actually have it turn into something that you can turn around and feed, not just your family, but ultimately the world. So that ability in itself is truly priceless. It's exciting to see what is happening right here because I'm a big fan of telling the diasporans to come back home. But when the diasporans come back home, sometimes they don't meet the right partners on grounds. At the end of the day, they lose everything that they have and they will still come back and say, Maya, you are the cost of our problems. <laughs> so seeing an African-American and Ugandan partnering over here makes me the happiest guy on earth right now. It's the first time of meeting you, but I think I know her. How, how come you change your name? <laughs> I had to change it, but my name has always been Christine. But of course, most people call me Tina. Two of them have done something incredible, and the fact that they use the name Value. Yeah. Why Value? Value Farm is just a name that we really chose for the company because we provide value to the people. We want to encourage farmers out there. We always just do not tell them theory, but we also show them what is actually happening at Value Farm all the time. And uh, just to dovetail on that, the main reason why Value Farm settled on our heart is because we wanted to come to the village and add something. 
Many people come to the continent, they take away, they enrich themselves, they try to take advantage of the situation. But for us, we wanted to come, elevate the, ourselves as a company, but also take our fellow brothers and sisters along with us here in the village. So, you know, people know everything comes from the village, the food, the garden, the water. But here at Value Farm, it's about teaching, it's about elevation, and it's about adding value back into our community. That's the reason why the majority of the people that work here are from the region. Before I continue this video, I'm just gonna ask for a favor. Like this video. I think I need 100,000 likes, 50,000 from African Americans, and 50,000 from Africans. Just to let you guys know that this is what we need for the continent. First of all, why Uganda in the first place? So for me, it was easy. Initially, I was actually well, I was supposed to come to your country. And the reason that is because when I started researching about, I looked into going to Portugal, I considered going to Mexico, I considered going to even maybe perhaps Brazil. But then when I actually started doing additional research about, you know, Africa as a whole, and everybody, even everybody in my family, the moment you Google Africa, period, the number one person that come up was you. <laughs> so <laughs> I found your videos first. Mm -hmm. I started watching from you. I also found a crazy American named O'Shea Duke Jackson, credit to him. Ironically enough, you guys actually know each other. Yep. But then I was set to go to Ghana. I was speaking to a team in Ghana and that gentleman decided to work with another group and it was okay. But as faith would have it, I found Tina. And my flight was booked to go to Ghana. I was gonna go to the Tema region. And then literally I found Tina. We started talking and it was, initially I reached out to a few people and she was one of three that actually wrote me back. We spoke, we hit it off. And the more we spoke, the more I realized like, number one, this young lady here was actually using her own money to do work for me while I was still in the US. So the reason we're here today is because of the people standing here. You understand? It started with you. <laughs> it led me to Tina, of course, O'Shea. But then Tina was a part of Value Farm from day zero because she started as my realtor partner on the ground trying to help me find a place. And she's the most integral part of what we do as a company. Thank you so much for representing Africans. You know, so sometimes the diasporans out there don't, don't believe in Africans on the ground. But you, you, you changed the whole narrative. Of course, of course. Why you decided to help him without even you knowing who he is? Yes, I had to, to help a brother who wanted to do something for the continent. And of course, you've always, I always watch your videos all the time. And I've seen people from the diaspora relocating here, but they have challenges with relocation. So as a person who had a platform already, hmm. and also showcasing what was in Uganda, I didn't want to be a bad person. So when he reached out to us, to me, I found that as an opportunity to really do something for the continent and also to help fellow youth. And of course, I was also working in a corporate job before that. And I quit because I wanted to do something. No, that that, would talk about faith and trust, which was the <laughs> remarkable aspect of what be, the way our relationship started. Because I came from a corporate background. Okay. I grew up on a farm in France, mm. right? But then, you know, the, in terms of negativity, we always hear about Africa as a continent. You can trust nobody here. They're gonna steal from you. They're gonna rob you. And so when I started speaking to Tina, it was the complete opposite. Literally, because even the, the gentleman behind the camera here, right next to your camera person, mm. these were the network of people I first met when I got to Uganda. And they've stuck by this project since day zero. So she's never, she's been nothing but integral. She's been fair. She's been, I mean, talk about sacrifice, her career, 10 years plus <laughs> yeah. working for a company. But when I said, Tina, I need you as my partner if I'm ever gonna make this work here, 
she actually resigned and made the full commitment. Yeah. And that's why we're here, and the company's been flourishing ever since. When I met Tina for the first time, she had no time. Like, she has to go to work every single day. That I think the videos that we had to film, we had to wait till Saturday yes. to film that video. That means Tina loved her job so much. Tina, why would you quit? Oh my God. I had worked in that job for over 10 years. I had invested all my life in that job. After university, when I got that job, I thought, you know, I'm going to make the money. I'm going to live a good life. But the money wasn't coming. The money wasn't <laughs> increasing. I was just living salary to salary. The same amount of money. There's no promotion at all. So that was a motivation for me, actually, even to start up a YouTube channel so that I can have side income. So when I started the side hustle of YouTube while working my nine to five job, mm. it was a big challenge. I even actually, to tell you the truth, I wanted to resign the third year into the job. But I kept on, you know, keeping there just because I feared the unknown. I didn't know what to expect <laughs> out there. So, of course, after you know, doing my research, also watching other people progressing. Good enough when my partner reached out, I saw this as an opportunity to be a loyal person, to have integrity, to help, and to do something better for myself as well. You don't regret quitting? I don't regret, not even a second, <laughs> not even. How long has this farm been in existence? We bought this land in 2021. What? Yes. <laughs> we started construction last year. 2022, yes, and we are still constructing. We put in some few animals already, and that's where it is right now. How many acres is this land? A little over 100 now. So what kind of farming are you doing in here? So at this farm we have goats, we have sheep, we have pigs, and of course, there's a house behind us that's gonna, we're gonna be introducing poultry in the near future. Because that way, um, one sector might actually be off season, but you're always earning. And if you do happen to, ex to experience loss, which is part of life, which is part of business, all four, even all five sectors can never crash at once. So you can still feed yourself and your family. What, what was the craziest thing you heard when you decided to come to Uganda? The craziest <laughs> thing I heard, my brother Jeffrey, my uncles told me, are you sure you want to go to Uganda? Is not where Kony, <laughs> <laughs> that guy in the bush? Mm -hmm. And then I was like, I actually, I didn't think about that one, but I knew about Idi Amin. <laughs> so, and for me, when they brought that up, I was, it was in the back of my mind. I was like, no, maybe it was, Maybe it was in Zambia. Maybe it was another place, but it sure is in Uganda. And my brother was like, are you sure you want to go there? I was like, actually, yeah. You know, I felt it in my heart, not to mention, you know, I've done a fair bit of traveling before with my prior career, but coming here, it was just like going to the Caribbean. As a matter of fact, my witness is right here. When I first got into my friend's car, as we were driving from the airport, I was like, bro, this looks just like Haiti. This looks just like any other country in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. you know, minus the ocean, mm -hmm. you know? So it felt comfortable. It felt like essentially I was coming home. And um, I have to say for those people out here that are watching from the Uganda, that are watching in the US throughout the Caribbean, being here on the continent, though I've been to Australia, London, you name it, the greatest fulfillment of my life is coming back here, especially on the continent, creating jobs here, opportunities, and actually doing something with that, bringing my experience from banking to actually have that benefit people here on the ground. You know, a lot of us are back home. I have a lot of friends back home that are Africans, mm. a lot of Nigerians, mm. a lot of folks from Ghana, actually. Yeah. You guys are great in banking. <laughs> And they're suffering in the U.S. And, 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 but I'm here, I'm thriving. You know, like I love the, the weather. I love the people. They're so nice, so kind. As long as you have a plan of action, anything is possible, especially when you have good partners. 
We are coming Boom. to the first structure. You go. First structure? Yeah. What is in here? I so, mean, you, you tell us, you know. You can hear them. Pigs? Yes. <laughs> pigs with no smell? Yes. That's different. Yeah. Hey, how, how did you guys do it? Pigs with no smell? Yes, we use the IMO. As you can see, this is a different kind of system that we're using. The indigenous microorganisms. And we also spray the IMO solution as well. So that the smell is not there in the house at all. That's what we're using. How many pigs are here? Uh, about 130 left because we've been actually upgrading our stock. At one point, this house had a total of 700 pigs. 700 pigs, but... But we decided to go just from meat processing to actually providing genetics. That's, that's the key. Whether you're in Zimbabwe, Ghana, everywhere you go, we tend to do both, but we realize the key how we can be most impactful is by getting the best genetics from South Africa and around the globe, so that way we can make it affordable Ooh. and feasible for the next person coming into the space. You don't have to have a billion shillings to start. You can actually start very little, and the whole model for our channel, you start That's small. small and think big. And so <laughs> as a company, we really practice what we preach. So we decided to actually get rid of a lot of the meat stock, though we had the best in the region. But we actually decided we were just gonna bring, believe me, and we're gonna introduce you to a young male pig. You guess the age. We spent, what, almost 1,600 USD for one pig so that we can get the proper genetics into this country. And we have many, many more to come because most folks can't afford to get a, a pig like this from South Africa. But when we have them here locally, yeah we can give it to them at the local price. See, I'm inside, <laughs> there's still no smell. How is that possible? Why, why this method? The re well, the reason we chose this method, I mean, it's not just for pure vanity or aesthetics. The reason we chose to go this way, because the pigs are more comfortable this way. So not only does it help with the overall, the, 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 the actual sand, um, cleanliness of the structure, mm. but it also makes it easier because when you have the regular slates, when you're breeding the pigs, you actually have to bring them to a different surface. Mm. Because if you have just a regular cement, if you have a 200, I would say a, a 120 to 140 kg bore mounting a female, a lot of the time they can get their hips displaced, they can break their legs. But by using this here, no matter which store you take them to, they're very comfortable. Not to mention, the more comfortable they are, the more they put on weight, it's easier for them to sleep. And at night, we don't have to worry about it getting too cold for the piglets because they provide natural warmth and natural overall relaxation for the pigs. And when it's time for the pigs to deliver, they know how to do their nesting. It's just overall beneficial across the board. And you see this young man here? That boy just came from South Africa. And if you can look at the muscle composition on this young buck, on this young piglet, itself is truly remarkable. The genetic enhancement that's gonna come from this pig, it will change the face of breeding in this whole region, right? Because as a company, we do from start to finish. What that means is we actually breed our own pigs from the time they conceived and we actually raise them till we actually take them for processing. And this pig genetic mm. will allow somebody to actually get process the pigs within four and a half to five months. Typically a regular pig would take up to six months, sometimes seven, seven. months. You understand? That's why you spent over fifteen hundred dollars to buy a pig like this. It's a game changer. How old is this pig right now? We want you to tell you us. Guess us. takes four months. <laughs> no, four and a half to five and months. Then I guess it's just two weeks. No. <laughs> <laughs> that is too early. No. This that one just really made, no, months. this one is a little of like a, a three months, exactly. Three months, exactly. Yeah. He's gonna be blowing up in no time. 
But it takes four months. Four and a half to five months. To get ready. Yeah. Yes. Now, bigger uh, than this? Yes. it's going to be a giant. Time. A giant. Is the feeding expensive? Yes, it is very expensive. If you don't really plan for your feeds, it's going to kill you. So with farming, with pig farming, you need to plan well in advance, even before you, you, you start your farm. Get somewhere that you can plant your maize, your soya, prepare so that you can definitely enjoy. Does it mean that you grow your own food here? Yes, we do. We do plant our own maize. Yeah, we'll take you to the field where we're actually preparing now as the season is about to come. We intend to plant at least 25 acres of, so of um, maize, at least five to six acres of soy. That then takes the feeding cost to like 25 to 20, 25%, mm. somewhere along there. But if you don't prepare, the feeding cost can run up to 80% of the cost. Yeah. So we always preach to people before, in fact, you know how many times people call us? We do something very different. Well, when people reach out, they're ready to give us the money but we consult with them, we're like, hey, listen, before you actually come pick up these cute little piglets that's gonna become giants in just two to three months, you should definitely source your food. If you can plant for yourself, do so. And we've actually turned away money by wanting to protect our fellow farmers coming into the business. But those same people, end up, when they come back ready, they always write us back and say thank you. And they refer more customers to us for doing the right thing from the get-go. How's the mortality rate? The mortality rate actually is very low for pig farming, especially okay. here, as long as you, you follow the biosecurity. Mm -hmm. Biosecurity is key. Do not let people just in and out of your pig mm. house. In this actual building here, we only have three people who are allowed to come here all the time. Other people, we employ, I think, around 15 people in the farm, yeah. but only three are allowed to get into this structure. So we don't really allow people to come in and out. So this also helps with the diseases not coming into the structure and also our pigs being safe in here. So the mortality rate actually is very low. We don't really treat that much. We only give our pigs iron shots when they're born at two weeks, at two mm. days, then at 21 days at well, as well. So will you say pig farming is profitable? <laughs> wow, that is a good question. Very, very profitable. Imagine. See, I mean, come closer. <laughs> I love numbers, you know. My, <laughs> my no, director. No, I, no, I did mathematics, on. so I'm very good at numbers, Take yeah? Me. So I just want to ask you this question. Yeah. If it's that profitable, yeah. does it mean it's, or it's, more, it's more profitable than the job that you're doing? Oh my God. So, <laughs> Tina, don't be bashful, tell them the truth, right? So, yes. so let me just help you here, and we can do this as you know, a team. Africans, we don't like talking about money, by the way. Bro, yes. I'm an American, I'm a banker, we talk about the money, and there's no shame in the money, all right? <laughs> so when it comes down to it, we, the, so we, as you mentioned before, yeah. we bought this land in, in the beginning of 2021, right? Yeah, 2021. And it took us about six months to start some, doing some of the fencing, building some of the structures that you're seeing now. Our first full year in pig farming, I'm gonna say on the average, let's say, not even hypothetically speaking, on an average weekend, and we make between 10, sometimes 15 million shillings per weekend. So the first year, she made almost 10, if not 12 times her million. salary, right? And pig farming. I know why she says she doesn't regret. I'm like, mm -hmm. why would you leave the corporate and you still don't regret leaving the corporate? I don't regret it at all, because I'm really happy here because 15 pigs to really compensate for my yearly <laughs> salary. Many people want to buy cars. Some people want to buy fancy cars. With us, oh we invested into the goats. You can never go wrong with these breeds. How? Because at the end of the day, you tell me what other company or stock or market you can invest $2,850 a year later, you have a return of at least nine to $10,000 in your bank account. You're looking at it. <laughs> Where did you get this breed from? South, South Africa. Africa. Yeah, South Africa. these are boars. These are boars? We have boars, we have savannas. 
Well, in here with the pure breeds, we have over 20, but we import at least four to seven, sometimes eight, okay. every other month. So the goal for us is to get up to about like 60 of the pure breeding pure stock. Breeds. And by next year, the goal is to have at least two to 300. Hmm. So that way we can start selling to the, to the general population. So really in total, we have over 300 so far for yeah. the crossbreeds. Yeah. They're in the field. You guys are millionaires. <laughs> I'm working with millionaires. <laughs> no. This is a dam, right? Yes. You guys it created is. it or it's just uh, natural? It was created. It was dug <laughs> the first time we came to the farm. The first investment, I think, was this. It was. Because, you know, in this village, there is water scarcity for the whole village. Most people used to really go to further places to fetch water. In fact, this was one of it. We have another one at the front of the farm mm. that we also give to the community. We have a one that we dug in the front of the farm. So during the dry season like this, we open it up. We provide water for the whole community. So people come from as far as 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers. We just keep it open, okay. unrestricted water for the whole area. Clean. Tap. Yeah. But this one is not clean, right? This one is, this clean. is clean. We filter it, but this is just for our animals. We can use this for irrigation. We use it for our pigs. We filter it here. We filter it at the point of, of intake, but we also treat it also in the tank, the as, tank well. as well. But this water, we do not drink. I, I, there's something that I want to know. You've been saying my partner, my partner, my partner, all this water. <laughs> you know, my PA is from Nigeria, and uh -huh. uh, she normally say my partner. Uh -huh. And my partner is actually the, uh, what do you call it? The boyfriend that she's not married. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. You know? We that... are business partners. Oh, business partners. <laughs> my business mm. partner. Oh. See, I'm from America. I'm you from could America. be my partner. Mm -hmm. He could be my partner. You know, if I had, if it was a relationship, I would say this is my girlfriend or my wife. No, my... no this is my business partner. Um, so you guys are just business partners? Business 100%. Will it encourage more partners like this on the motherland? You have to. That's mm -hmm. the only way you're going to make it. Now, you know, from my personal experience and from also doing research, we get that there's quite a few Americans, folks from the UK, you know, even, you know, other parts of the world hmm. that come to the continent and they face challenges. Well, the best way to help navigate those, those rough waters is by actually having somebody who is from that environment, who could be trusted, that can actually help guide you through that process. So yeah, this is a no-brainer. Trust is the key here. Trust, integrity is the key ingredient. <laughs> what has been the biggest challenge that you faced on this journey? The biggest challenge we've had so far, I'm sorry to steal this from you, my friend, okay. is that, you know, we have a YouTube channel as well. So whenever people see our f f workers on our YouTube videos, they always come and poach them. <laughs> so it's very difficult for us to keep talent. You know, because people feel that they work for Value Farm, they must they be the best trained. So that you can have like a great employee, happy with the way they're being paid here. Next week, you pay them, au revoir. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> we, gone. we constantly have to hire new people. And it's a good thing because with us, we don't want to hold anybody back, you know? As a matter of fact, I take it as a source of pride when we have workers that came to us initially helping us with our fencing. Then they get promoted to the herd and then ultimately assistant management. We even have an assistant management training program that we institute here. So if we see somebody that actually have, you know, the right attitude, the right passion, we actually start to have that person work very closely mm -hmm. with, with the different department managers. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately it's either we're gonna expand or when somebody reaches out to us, we can recommend that, that individual for an opportunity to become a manager elsewhere. That's how you're supposed to do it. Each one, teach one. One thing that I must commend you, the fact that you came to the motherland, yeah. saw the opportunity, took advantage of the opportunity, but I believe that me and her, being on the motherland, we never saw this we opportunity. We didn't see this. Right? Mm, that's true. What are the opportunities that you've seen so far that you think the people living on the motherland needs to take advantage of it. I have to tell you that's like the greatest question of all time. But even before I answer that question, like we at times we discuss this, right? And you should definitely get where I'm going with this. I, where I'm from in the US, 
it's not all roses, you know? We have challenges there too. But the one thing I can tell you guys, there's something called classical conditioning. You know, when you're a poor kid, you grow up in a poor area, whether you're in the village, you could be in that village from the time you're born until you turn 21 or even 25 as a grown man. If that village has always been poor, if an outsider come in there and tell you, you know what, where you live in your village, one day, this is gonna be a city. Tema, 25 years ago, if somebody told those people who were living there that Tema was gonna become a metropolis like it's becoming right now, that poor villager living there would never believe it. So for me, with virgin eyes, the moment I got off the plane, everywhere we went, and I'm sure they get tired of me telling them how beautiful this area is. Even on the dusty road coming here, how beautiful it is, how other folks from the US, you know, Caucasians, black, whatever, they will find beauty in what we have here. But the people that are born here, it's so hard to see it because you've been conditioned for that. So for me, as far as opportunity in agriculture, it's endless, particularly in processing. Because in your country, you guys are the kings of palm oil production. Yeah. Here in Uganda, we need more people to get involved into processing. What, I mean, what do I mean by that? Value addition, we need a group of folks. Guys, if you're out there, if you wanna get into farming, you don't wanna get your hands dirty, get into value addition because we have so much fruits in this country that goes to waste. We have so much avocados just dying on the vines, on the trees here, that could easily be converted into avocado oil, peanut oil, right? If someone can make the investment to build a peanut oil processing facility, that's how a local person from Uganda can become a billionaire with USD. It's in value addition and oil production, not the black oil. That one we know we'll never control. But in agriculture, everybody has a shop. If you come here, whether you're interested in getting into real estate, real estate development, agriculture, you don't have to be a farmer to benefit from what farmers do. There are opportunities there when it comes to making fresh juices, processed juices, it's all here. But we're just so accustomed to just having all the mangoes you can eat and let the rest of it go to ruins, right? But then a German person will come here. Somebody from the Netherlands will come here. They'll set up a very basic factory. Before you know it, they are authentic billionaires. The one thing I would change about this country, because like being from a different part of the world, you know, a lot of folks here don't recognize how they have riches here. You know, again, for my world as a banker, we would talk about liquid. What's liquid capital, liquid cash? A lot of Africans may think they're poor. They might be cash poor, but they're very wealthy when it comes to their natural resources. And a lot of these guys that are complaining that they're poor, they need to have the paradigm shift to get out of Kampala, go back to the village, because the money is truly in the soil. And you don't need to complain, you don't need to wait for the government to do for you. As long as you are not handicapped, you have your arms and your legs are working just fine, you have sound mind, sound body, go back to the village and get back to basic and you can pull yourself out. Wow, your final message to Africans in the diaspora. Oh my gosh, final message guys, it's time to come home, you know? Being a New Yorker, I'm sure you can hear the heavy New York accent. I have so many of my friends and family members. They admire what I do here. True story. I get so many of my friends that want me to invest their money here for them on the continent, but I refuse. I want them to come back and do it for themselves. I can be a guide. I can show them the way because I've been here now for over two years. So you guys, it's time to come fishing time to come home, stop with the excuses, mm -hmm. get out of the office, get out of the cold winters of New York, get out of the bitter winters of Canada, come back to the motherland and come get this real money. The opportunity is here. Do not despise farming. We have the opportunity, grab it, and make something out of the opportunity. 
do not just underdog farming. We are farmers, we are happy, educated, yeah. but we are dirty. We are, the, we, are, we are digging what we feeding the world. We are feeding the society. We are feeding the nation. So let's grab this opportunity, guys. It's the good Lord's work. Yes. <laughs> Oh, my God.